Uh, for those that I haven't met, uh, my name is Tara Rota, and I'm a first year MFA student. Um, and it's going to be my honor tonight to introduce Jean Shin, uh, who is one of our newly appointed faculty members. I had the pleasure of being in Jean's first crit group, crit group this semester, which I found to strike an admirable balance between the pragmatic and the poetic. The class conversations uh, continue to resonate with me, and Jean's perspective is something that I find quite compelling, so I'm so looking forward to learning more about her work tonight. Uh, Jean is recognized for her monumental installations that transform collections of everyday objects into elegant expressions of identity and community. For each project, she accumulates quantities of a particular item, such as lottery tickets, broken umbrellas, lost socks, prescription pill bottles, and trophies, many of which are often sourced through donations made by individuals from participating communities. These obsolete objects are meticulously deconstructed, altered, and ultimately re-engaged as material for Shin's conceptually rich work. Through this labor-intensive process, her sculptures, videos, and site-specific installations reflect both the personal and collective experience, the intimate and the infinite. Shin's work has been widely exhibited in over 150 major museums and cultural institutions, including solo exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art in Arizona, and her works have also been on view at the New Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the Museum of Fine Art Boston, Asia Society, Brooklyn Museum, Queens Museum, Museum of Art and Design, Barnes Foundation, among others. Shin also realizes large-scale permanent installations commissioned by major public agencies. She recently completed a landmark commission for the MTA's Second Avenue subway at the 63rd Street Station in New York City. Jean has received numerous awards, including two New York Foundation of the Art Fellowships, Korea Arts Foundation of America, Pollock Krasner Foundation Grant, and the Asian Cultural Council, among others. She has been featured in many publications, including Art in America, Sculpture Magazine, Art News, Freeze Art, Flash Art, Hyperallergic, Artsy, Brooklyn Rail, and the New York Times. Jean was born in Seoul, South Korea, and raised in the United States, where she received a BFA and a master's from Pratt Institution in Brooklyn, where she is now a tenured adjunct professor. She lives and works in Brooklyn, New York, and please join me in welcoming her to the mic. Thank you so much. Um, it is a pleasure to be here, and really, um, I do identify myself as an artist and also an educator, and so when I look out in the crowd, um, I'm often used to seeing um, art audiences, enthusiastic, but it's really different when you see your students out there. So um, this is really it for you guys, because we've always said, well, I wish we were also having a studio visit where you were coming over here, <laughs> you know? So of course, this is a digital presentation, so it's just unlike a studio visit, unlike a critique. Um, and I really want to emphasize that. If you get a chance to go see some of these works in person, uh, you should, because it's a very, very different experience. But so is an artist's talk. Um, so I'm going to be sharing with you some ideas, insights, sharing with you behind the scenes kind of thing, and of course, open to questions. Um, and if you have pr something pressing, please raise your hand and I'll entertain those as well. Um, but I wanted to sort of walk you through some of these um, projects that I do, and I'll say that most of my works um, are site-specific, um, and so I'm often invited to an institution to think of ideas and just kind of generate the work. Um, so I divided the slides into sort of beginning with some of my early works, but kind of curated around certain themes. And this theme in particular is, uh, started with my earliest work. So this is an installation. Um, I'm glad this is a low podium, although I could lower the mic, because it's the height of my own body that in interested me. When I was a student, I was studying painting and drawing, and so ideas of proportion and measuring a unit still really retain uh, importance in my work. So here, these are pant cuffs that have been altered, gathered. Um, so it's a measurement that is unique to a person's body that you don't get to see. And that's what I liked about it. So it was something invisible. 
you know, and oftentimes in figure drawing and when you study anatomy, you don't look at appearances, you start to understand what's happening behind the body structure. Um, and so this early project, um, when I started uh, right outside grad school, it really shifted my practice, first from a painter, really full on to an installation artist. It also got me outside the studio. I had to collect these. Once I started to find the remnants in my own drawers, and oh, I always have to measure out two and a half inches of fashion I, that doesn't fit. It's the height unwanted from my body. And then thinking about like, what are the various other heights that people have secretly hidden away, trimmed, altered? And so um, I started to walk around the corner of my studio and ask the local um, alteration shops for these little scraps of fabric. And in that um, was this incredible place of exchange with the, the society, the community, the neighborhood. And in fact, it brought me to my own neighborhood. A lot of the shops were owned by Korean, if not immigrants. So suddenly I was sort of in my other space of negotiating these materials. Um, a lot of those ideas, of course, um, coming from a, um, artists at the young age when I um, was looking at materials and things, they were free. All I had to do is like convince them I would stop in and pick up these whenever it was convenient for them. So this kind of negotiation of um, working with different people, there was a slight uh, collaboration that I was doing. Oftentimes my materials were inspired from the street, like literally walking from the subway to my studio. At a rainstorm, I'd see these broken umbrellas and, and kind of consider why were they thrown out? Um, and of course, if you inspect them, it's usually one little mechanism that failed, broken, that little hinge, and then the whole umbrella apparatus is thrown out. But then it made me think of like, these are ob uh, objects that were designed for obsolescence, you know, for disposability. And our culture was sort of meant to use these and use them up and, dis and discard them. And so I would create these installations that re-envisioned this material very differently for a different context, different purpose. So I rescued these umbrellas, cleaned them, deconstructed them, re-sewed them. So I was sort of mending them together into a new space. And here it's a cloud at Socrates Sculpture Park. Um, suddenly I was outdoors. I was a painter <laughs> in what I studied. And here I am doing these installations. So the materials really brought me to sites, like the pants needed to be on the floor, take up space like a crowd, taking space that didn't exist. You know? So then it was that I took up the floor space. And in my early installations, I was showing at like exit art, art in general, um, all these um, um, artist space, you know, these nonprofit spaces, all the walls were, had premium, you know, painters and photographers took all the walls. And then they were like, you, but you can do anything you want in this, you can have the entire floor. <laughs> so I started to be known for taking on the floor, right? Um, and so then the outdoor installations, I wanted to pick a material that would also be from the outdoor and weather resistant. So the umbrellas uh, that were literally found from the street and reintroduced in a different context made sense. But the piece was, um, to me, again, each piece taught me something, so in this, arena, when I took it outside the studio, it was taken up by the wind and the elements and the sun. And I had no idea that I was creating a kinetic sculpture. Um, and so that to me was a learning curve. Like I, I sort of embraced the idea that I couldn't figure everything out in the studio, that I allowed the process of installation, allowed the site to also inform how the final piece would interact with the public. And so it created both a shade, but it also created incredible movement. And it captured the wind and kind of took a breath and had like a kinetic movement uh, that really surprised me. So having done these large scale installations in a number of nonprofits, um, a uh, young curator at the Museum of Modern Art noticed my work and asked me to do a project at MoMA. So this is my first solo show, um, a lot of pressure as a young artist to do something there. And I think I characterized my work at the time as found objects, and I really wanted to shift that. I wanted to be something site specific. So that I asked the MoMA staff and the curators um, to then envision a material that I could get from the site only. So this is a common material, a clothing, but it was procured by the curators and specifically the staff at the time. So um, if you know any institutions, you know, like MoMA, they seem to 
kind of have a branding, but the people who work there also are just like any other group of people. Like some get along, some don't, some wish they had, they had the other job, some's not happy with their, you know, so there's all these hierarchies and fractured nature of any organization. Um, and since I was working at uh, these institutions as a cultural worker, I really understood the dynamics of this. And so when I was invited as an artist to show my work, I really wanted the viewer, um, the museum viewer, to understand that these art pieces, these master works don't just go up you know that there's a whole group of people who actually make this happen so this piece um, invited the museum staff to donate an article of clothing which i uh, deconstructed and then represented it back in the public space so it was greeting the visitors uh, before they walked in and it was really about the again the invisible community that was actively at work to give them that experience um, from that, um, I was also invited to do these permanent installations, and that really shifted how I thought of the site and the user as well. Um, this was a government building, so uh, the users were veterans as well as um, immigration and citizenship. Those are the two headquarters in this government building. So I really thought, well, that's an interesting community. Um, one, of course, has my own history with it having immigrated to this country. The other was something that was very much a foreign body to me, but in America, the central body, the one I, um, that, that's militarized, known as the US government. Um, the armed forces. So I used those um, conduits there as ambassadors to connect to those communities. So here, uh, the military, because they know their veterans could reach out and they could give me their uniforms. And it was a real exchange to see if they would um, honor um, this art project by giving me the one art of clothes that they had experienced trauma and war through uh, to mark that history through this public work. And then the citizens and immigrants, they were saying, well, a lot of this is like paperwork they receive. We never really know if they're going to show up. We never know the whole full process. The only time we really are with them is the day that they show up to literally say the oath to, and their pledge of allegiance to the United States. So at that ceremony, they said, why don't you come to the ceremony and, and talk about your public art? So this is where um, they're so anxious, of course, to get through this process. And then I uh, come up like this at a stadium podium and invite them. So before we start, <laughs> um, I want to first acknowledge what's happening here, which is this whole huge journey that I have similarly gone through with my parents um, immigrating to this country. And so I wanted to kind of map that journey and invite them uh, at this very moment to be part of the public art project. So these kind of participatory um, aspects of communities that I don't know, but are loosely organized by the artwork itself. So literally, um, this man, this Greek man, um, was so excited, he went to my table after the ceremony and said, I want to sign up. I'm literally giving you the shirt off that the day he was wearing. Thankfully, he was wearing an undershirt because um, he said, I, I'm going to leave. I'm going to be so busy. I'm going to be so consumed. And I want to mark this day in the way you talked about your public work. Um, but I'm going to be too consumed. And so he literally gave me that shirt. Others, of course, um, came back and, you know, literally mailed me a photo of the uniform, um, a picture of the ceremony that day, um, and kind of thought of the specific unique clothing that would mark that um, occasion. Um, that sort of became a strategy for me, like how I don't now have to get my own materials, but in fact, the organization that invites me and often commissions the work could be my partner. And I really work with them to figure out what are the sources um, that are here, what are the resources, what are the, you know, oftentimes it doesn't have to be funding, it can be just will and a lot of determination that we decide how to make this project work. So when Asia Society asked me to do a project, um, they said, we're going to start a show that starts in New York and it's going to travel all over the country. And we'd like you to do something site specific. So I was very confused, like how could it be site specific in New York and then it moves and you're not recommissioning me, you're, you want the same work to travel. 
So that was kind of the premise. So I love this kind of challenge. How can I kind of work within my strategies that I'm doing, but also change and learn from this new premise? So here I was um, really inspired by the, the Asia Society as a, as a starting point. And it was Asian curators mapping uh, contemporary Asian uh, American voices. So I asked them to give me their sweater. And um, so it literally mapped their being and then their connections. So they were doing a lot of studio visits all over the country to figure out who this checklist was. And I was sort of curious who they were looking at, who they were connected to. Um, and so I had asked them to give me their sweater and then invite everyone that they felt were part of our arts community. Um, I was inspired by this literature, um, Calvino's Invisible Cities, um, and it really talked about this nomadic city that would come and um, have a contract, and their contract was literally tying strings in the air uh, with a knot. And then, of course, everyone has a relationship with someone because you can't do anything by yourself. You know, you want bread, you want to go to school, you need to, you know, um, fix a car, you know, you, you need negotiating um, contracts. So these strings would be strung all over, they would have to be abandoning their cities and moving on, so it became nomadic. And then they'd move to a new site and they did, they'd build again. So they start with the first idea of the first relationship to keep going. So my installation similarly would be built on site, disassembled, moved to site, and then rebuilt. Uh, and we begin once again. Every new city um, was then invited to um, add to this growing network of Asian Americans. And each person who participated showed me who they knew on the map. So this was before social media. Um, so we literally had no idea who knew who. Um, and so it was a real chance of like trying to figure out how many degrees of separation are we as a, as a um, community, as a network, um, who's central to that, um, who's most connected, who's least connected, and to how many degrees. And then as people are installing the piece, um, I also, it requires like another group of people to activate the making of the installation. And in that way, they're almost learning the network and learning the players and learning the Asian American names. Um, so it was kind of the sharing of this knowledge um, as well. So a lot of my works then suddenly started to become very, very labor intensive. They were not only labor intensive in the studio, but like part of installing the work and the um, site became a place of production. Um, so that became sort of an interesting um, expansion of my practice. Um, I'm showing you some of these projects that was in my recent show this year in the spring at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And it was shown at the textile gallery. So we um, worked to work toward all these um, different projects that had a textile base component to it. And these are some of my early works that had shoes. I uh, deconstructed shoes, always a sort of a remnant of the body, it seems, and then brought together to have a very, very different context. So here I'm stripping the shoes back to its material context, um, not thinking about fashion, but thinking about where did this material come from be it before it was consumed. Um, so like the calf and the pelts. And then the other time I was in a residency at Materials for the Arts, um, I was seeing a different waist strain come through in the studio warehouse and it was um, high-end fashion designers like dumping their scraps, their industrial size wares into the warehouse. So this is the leftover of Marc Jacobs um, seasonal collection and so it was all their leather scraps and I was really curious to piece it together and try to understand what they kept and what they wanted to hide what was not, what was really literally rejected. And so um, they became like new bodies of like desire and the de future desire, because we're always inventing those um, and projecting those into it. But the edges and the scars, you know, the whole um, you know, felting process and tanning process is so to toxic, environmentally unfriendly. Um, and full of scars and perfections. Those are all things that you know the fashion designers don't really want us to be thinking about. Um, so a lot of recent works I've been um, following objects, and today when you follow objects, of course, you think about climate action and 
the need that environmentally we're not able to sustain this level of production of disposable uh, goods in our lives. So these are another project I just did recently last year at Wave Hill. Um, I created a levee. Um, I was hit by uh, Sandy in, in the hurricane. Um, and so I was thinking about emergency readiness and the need for our communities to get together. And so um, sandbags are always the first go-to, except they're not available, they're too heavy to move, um, all of those problems that happen in an emergency. So I invented an idea of collecting demon from the community, filling it with your own size that you could move in case you needed to protect your, um, your flood zones. And also then thinking about what would a real levee that would protect uh, the south part of Brooklyn look like, you know, and what, what kind of human toll it would take. Um, so those are sort of the, a lot of the f fashion um, works that I've been working on. Um, and I want to then jump to, there was a whole other body of works that are really about ephemera. Um, and so these were lotto tickets that I would find, uh, literally walking from my studio to my apartment and back. And I had this fantasy like, oh, if only they were the one dollar as opposed to the one dollar spent and lost. Um, and so I kept thinking like I would have you know, five to twenty dollars every each time walking back and forth in my commute. And what struck me was thinking about the people who played the lotto tickets and what motivated them when there was just so much loss that I could see on the street right there. Um, but in fact, um, each of these units kind of had embedded a sort of an optimism um, and that I was self-identifying with that and the impulse to sort of take those risks and, and kind of build on something that's an artist's life, right? You go to the studio not knowing it's not a guarantee that the, the thing you're working on is going to work out. And what is what usually happens if we ask any artist um, any day? Well, I put in the time, it didn't work, you know, but I learned something. I'm going to go back tomorrow, right? So this idea that there's this kind of like the reality check of always losing was a known reality, but that you felt more optimistic somehow that you were going to get it the next time. And so this bid, building of this massive city was something that we totally understood, that it was against the, uh, the logical odds, um, but that it was kind of this um, very addictive idea of building something that comes out of labor and hard work and tenacity and perseverance, um, just like any other city, much like New York and those ideas of like the American dream. So this is my assistant starting that city from the very, very beginning. So again, every single time this piece is up for loan, they have to sort of hire my assistant and ask to be on site to build it one at a time. So it becomes almost a, a private performance for us and um, us channeling the time and energy to build each of these structures on site. And it's like a house of cards, essentially. Nothing is glued, it's just balanced. Um, so a lot of my work has this duality of being seemingly resilient um, made out of everyday objects that have sort of been failed or lost or devalued and then finding kind of a different way to think about how we're connected to this and how it creates a new value system. And so this is um, prescription pills, um, the bottles. And so again, it's a way for me to talk about the vulnerabilities of our body, um, the ones that we are struggling with that often don't get talked about or seen visibly. It's not a huge handicap, but often one that has secret um, pain and suffrage, um, and of course has a whole political content about who has coverage and so on. So these are in one object, a discard that people throw away all the, all the time, but if you follow that, you get to the stories of our, basically our lives and, and people who are really, really vulnerable and connected, or through drugs holding on, right? And so there's also a story of optimism. Um, but there's also a critique of America, you know, have like the overconsumption of things, like over consuming and being over prescribed drugs as well. Um, and then I did it, I'm actually currently in a project at the museum, uh, I'm sorry, the Bro BAM, the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Um, and this project actually st started there as well. I was thinking about 
um, the idea of the next wave and performance in relationship to visual arts. And so I wanted to capture that with a material. And so my solution was to make this kind of awesome, like tsunami-like wave um, that is very much inspired by Japanese art. Um, and doing that out of real obsolesc obsolescence, like the old 78 records. Um, this was a collection that was inherited to me through my in-laws when his uh, grandfather passed away. So they're um, sort of a collection of one person's musical um, interest, you know. And so it's sort of hearing through the body that no longer exists. And so I wanted to also capture that with the sculpture as well. Um, so a lot of these materials um, deal with obsolescence. You know, when you deal with technology, the minute you're, it's in use, there are people already inventing the next um, and upgraded uh, version of that. So I did a project with the Fabric Workshop Museum, um, which are, if you're ever in Philadelphia, please go visit their archive because they've just done incredible projects. So when I engaged with them, I really again talked about the institution's memory and that they had done a lot of printmaking, worked with fabric. And so I was trying to think about how to um, kind of expand that conversation for me. Um, and so I created this textile and it's made out of keycaps um, and sort of riffing on the pun of the word textile. And also at the time, um, I had just had um, my first child and it was really hard to be in Philadelphia all the time. So I realized as an artist, my production had changed into a virtual one, that I was like up at different times of the night and composing my emails to my project manager is what I was thinking about, what we can dream about, and then the next day, things would be active when they got there and then they would respond back to me. So I realized that what I was producing was the perfect email, you know, that was a conceptual project to a certain degree. Each of these uh, caps are a translation of our email, so you can literally read the sculpture and you're reading our emails. So for every uh, letter, um, we found a keycap. So we worked with different recycling um, centers in Philadelphia to capture the e-waste. Um, and then we activated the first sentence, um, which was their invitation to me to do this project and that someone could sit and interact with it. So it became an interactive technology-based uh, work. These are interns, the summer interns took on this project. They literally made an alphabet of keycaps and then they transcribed my emails back and forth with the, to the museum to make the textile piece. Um, so it takes a lot of labor and I wanted to share that as well because I'm not, I'm not the only one um, working on these projects. Um, I have a lot of, of course, huge reliance on the participants who really bring the ideas and the materials to me and that exchange is really important. But then I have a group of assistants and interns and also within the organization, um, a, a group of uh, staff members and so on. It's a pretty large group of people who get involved to realize the project. Um, and that's an important thing to know. Um, and to me, the reason that's important is that we're, it's almost like teaching. It's like this engagement. We're doing something together for a short time, and it brings us closer by the, the, the work. Um, so this is um, a recent project that I did. Um, it opened in Pioneer Works. Um, when I was at the residency at Materials for the Arts, they get donations from MoMA, the Met, you know, every museum, every fashion industry, every big tech world. Um, and so they happen to have gotten um, the Met saying that they got, they're getting rid of their entire 35 millimeter slide archive. They've held on to it for over a decade. They've digitized it and they're ready to move on. So uh, they appointed some artists that they thought might be interested in this material, and so they organized this exhibition. And of course, um, I let the other artists pick through the contents of it, and then I said, I want to get the archive. I wanted the whole experience. I want to recategorize um, the experience of being able to walk through the 35 millimeter slides that had been in storage and you know held away from the public for so long. So this idea for me was thinking about the uh, fragility of institutional memory, how once these images don't exist in 35 millimeters and they were gone or abandoned, um, that we're not quite sure if the digital process will work out for us. First, we lose context. Um, we no longer, um, we can have search engines, but if we don't know what we're searching for, how do we find anything, right? They're just sort of uh, locked. 
So for me to be able to physically walk through so-called this cloud of materiality um, is a way of discovering um, these new narratives. Um, I'm, I'm moving to these other ideas. I've talked about the cloud as a space that you can move through, but I also do um, other works that have environmental impact. And so this is a project that I did at Scottsdale. And so um, as an outsider coming to a new place, I'm sort of struck by the landscape. And here, this is literally mountains. And I felt like everyone who was a local understood the mountains trajectory. They knew where they were. They knew if there was north, southeast, just like if you were in the city, you can have these landmarks. And as a newcomer, I didn't have that orientation. So I wanted to create a project that really talked about the familiarity of these spaces. Um, but the object that I did that through was with keys. Um, so again, keys are spaces that are really intimate. And those, you know, if you hand someone your keys, they're not going to know which space it opens or where it goes and where it leads. But you, in the back of your pocket, you could pick it up, know it's your mailbox, your bike key, your home key, your office key, you know. So this kind of notion of the intimate, how this uh, profile creates um, an access point. But then, of course, um, in Arizona, they're mining their resources, literally mining um, the mountains to get copper, and that is a component of making these keys. Um, so it's a, always a double-edged sword. So I recreate the topography with the resources um, that are being mined out. Um, another project I did at the Smithsonian American Art, um, you know, I was thinking of Washington, D.C. as a site um, that is both national, you know, and that tourists go and think about those monuments and, and what it means to be an American oftentimes. Going to the Capitol is such an experience of visiting uh, the mall. And for me, this the National Mall was a place that would be um, the most captivating because they designed it to be empty. And so they didn't understand who would be the future leaders or the future people and what they would want from government. And so knowing that democracy was a big experiment, still continuing to learn from itself, um, I wanted to make this project. And this project actually happened during the time that um, Obama was being elected. So time full of optimism, let's just say. Um, and so I built this platform and I thought of like, who would we make a monument to? And so I decided that um, in all the crevices of basements and attics and suburban um, um, places all over the country would be these little trophies um, that were really monuments um, of our own history that were sort of abandoned and I wanted to bring them together um, to talk about like what do we really hope for and um, oftentimes it has nothing to do with sports and our acknowledgments when we receive them which is um, in childhood so this is a basketball player who's now a mechanic or like a chef who is a master karate um, cook. You know, so re really reinventing the notions of an everyday hero, uh, things that we do in our adulthood and every day um, that sort of get unacknowledged. So in this project, this is a view of my studio. So a project kind of takes over. I had collected over 2,000 trophies, and it meant that we had to transform 2,000 little figurines that were two or three inches in plastic. So it was quite a labor-intensive task, kind of drove us nuts trying to realize the project. Um, but then it gets realized, and we have built the platform, and every trophy um, kind of goes to, New York, to Washington, D.C. And I feel like the pilgrimage is something that the people who donate the piece really look for, and the coming together of the project at the end. Um, so a lot of the um, works that I'm doing, it allows each participant to give an object uh, trusting that it would be transformed and be part of something much bigger than their own history. Um, but I am deconstructing that and recontextualizing their narrative to talk about something much more broader. Um, this is a project that I did in Montclair, uh, New Jersey, and um, another site that's full of like beautiful homes and the domestic life, and, and, and beautiful homes often come with beautiful landscaping. Um, so I wanted to turn their trees and landscapes into something as um, <coughs> reflective of their kind of historic elegance of the domestic life. So these are uh, knives um, that have all been welded together to mimic um, the rings of a tree um, or the beauty of their landscape. Um, but also in, in, in a chance talking about 
um, kind of highlighting where are we as a domestic life and as families go. You know, we're not even sitting around the table. No one's setting these tables anymore. You know, we just had a holiday. How many families are actually traveling, getting together, you know? Um, oftentimes we're just eating on the go and really not making time for those conversations around the table. So it really talks about the new reality, the fractured reality and our health. Um, I wanted to show you some of the other projects that I do. I, I often do these long-term permanent works and this also had a conversation just same thing about domesticated lives that inform our institutional life. So this is a public school system, it was an elementary school, so I asked the first PTA who was entering the class to give me um, what other plates from their setting. So it was a chance to map their identity at home for their child's um, school. And so each participating family sort of got to map themselves within our larger community. Um, this is another project that I did with MTA in Flushing, Queens. It's permit, so you can go visit. Um, and here, when I was asked to do a project in Flushing, Queens in a competition for this, I kind of thought, this is where I have to really talk about being Korean and finding an object that really would resonate specifically to that community. And so for me, it was a celadon, because it was such an inherited um, story of perfection that got passed on to me. So I went back to Korea and worked with potters and worked with their remnants. So Celadon is like a very sophisticated um, production where 40 to 60% is, goes to waste because it has to be so perfect. Um, so a lot of the pottery is broken um, by the artist, artisans because they don't want it to leave their studio. So these ateliers have these massive landscapes of waste and I was so inspired by it. <laughs> I thought it was more beautiful than the vases that they wanted us to buy. So I said, could we um, take them and make a public art project because I wanted to take the um, imperfect and bring it to new context. So my fabricator um, repositioned every little piece of uh, silicon waste and created a new form. Um, and then we would take that kind of idea on site in Dallas and make sculptures out of them with um, graduate students um, on site. And I wanted to kind of again rediscover Korean celadon in places that you wouldn't expect to see. Um, but that the celadon was similar to my critique of um, Korean diaspora, you know, um, the separation between like motherland and the new existence and new contexts. Um, I do a lot of public works um, outdoors, and of course, it always starts again with my site visit. So this is in Louisville, um, and they wanted a project out in the river. But when I got there, uh, there was a big flood, and they were very embarrassed because um, the flooding had gotten a lot of this waste down the river stream embedded in their landscape. And I was like, there's my idea. <laughs> Let's clean it up. You know, because what is public art supposed to do except, you know, get people involved in coming to the site and in some sense beautify the space. And so the first thing to do is have the community pick up the trash. So part of the project was to say Jin Shin needs plastic picked up from the site. So they were picking up plastic. Across the river was a fossil bed. And I really wanted to talk about the two existences that we are leaving behind this plastic forever. And so what, what does that mean? So I embedded the found plastic into their pavements. And so these, these mysterious plastic things would be here forever for us. So it's really a question about our environmental impact, um, what we're doing with our waste products. Um, and I've sort of moved to a lot of projects that deal with plastic waste because again, like technology is prevalent and it continues to um, need some action. Um, so I'm also talking about how everyday materials can be transformed by everyone. So this project I did um, um, at the Figgy Art Museum and so I gave them the idea and the prototyping and then they worked with the school systems in that city and the educators went and did the Jean Shin sculpture. So everyone made sculptures from elementary school to high school and the workshops at the Museum for Adults and so on. So they made these green um, hybrid sculptures. It was um, part soda um, and we were really specifically targeting Mountain Dew in particular uh, that has a high um, corn syrup content. 
to looking as if they're corn stalks. So these are corn fields in Iowa, and I really wanted to talk about how the overproduction of corn fields have really transformed our landscape, and that we're not really consuming corn, we're consuming corn products and highly processed foods. So this installation took about 8,000 people who participated in building the sculpture, and I created this like corn maze. Um, and it was literally consumed by, you know, the sodas were consumed by the community, transformed into their new corn landscape, creating a maze. And then it was a, an opportunity where the audience could come and navigate the maze. And for me, that was a critique. Like, how did we get here? How did we find our way out of here? This kind of crazy landscape of what seems natural, but is entirely manufactured. Um, and with that, I'm going to end um, with my project, if you're uptown, on the 63rd Street and 3rd Avenue entrance, the 2nd Avenue train. Um, the 2nd Avenue is not something new, though it did get realized and opened in the century. Um, so it was almost 80 plus years old as an idea and a concept just never built. And this was the first site that they selected an artist to actually open um, the 2nd Avenue. So what I did was talk about infrastructural changes in New York City. I went to the archive and looked at these beautiful pictures of the elevated trains that were also being dismantled. So again, the city being disrupted through infrastructure change. So when they lost the elevator, they surely thought they were going to get the underground in the 40s and 50s, and they never got it. So as new, um, our generation goes underground, think, oh, I'm taking the new subway. I wanted them, you know, to kind of have a conversation. What are these structures? And of course, it was the old structures that were abandoned back in the 40s and 50s. When I was looking through the archive, of course, the beautiful surprise was the pictures I saw and some of the New Yorkers who were in those pictures by accident. There are anonymous people who happened to just be captured in the photo, and they never saw the subway. And I wanted to give them the subway, literally, by bringing them out from history into the contemporary space uh, and reorganizing a new kind of narrative around it. Um, some of the research, of course, um, the streetscape changed because this dark elevated train left the avenues and the blue sky came back. And of course, as we're riding the elevated, we also no longer have the sky. So I wanted to bring back the sky. The silhouette of the elevated train is then superimposed with this beautiful mosaic of skies. And then all the New Yorkers that I found captured and recontextualized into the mosaic. Um, love these beautiful ladies who are commuting and reading magazines and waiting for the train. Uh, the last component, of course, is that you had the ability to ride the elevated train um, and no longer are you doing that at this site. So I wanted to talk about those beautiful vistas of the city and recreate them as you <coughs> enter the platform to wait for the train. So um, you can see it in real life. <laughs> I ran through a lot of images, um, and I am really open to questions and having a conversation with you guys. So um, there was a lot there. <laughs> this is a very basic question, but for the lotto ticket piece, yeah, how did you? How were the institutions okay with you making something that had no glue? And then I'm assuming was very precarious. Yeah. Um, so it's it's sort of you know I like to challenge the institutions a bit. You know, so when everyone's like, oh, you should make sculpture that should be glued, and we just art handlers open up the crate, lift it, and we're done. You know, I kind of go, why? You know. So the challenge is the project. And for me, um, I have to sell them on the beauty of the work. The fragility is what we're looking for. The anticipation that a viewer walks by and be like, oh, that's. Definitely not a house of cards, like a house of cards. I know a house of cards, you know. And so it really brings them back to the piece and to look really carefully. And when they do, I mean, I've had people literally stop breathing in front of the piece and like walk back, you know? Like almost as if treating it like a newborn, they whisper and they get really quiet. And I just love that, like that stacking a few pieces of paper affects the whole body, their interaction with other people, you know, they move away from the space, want to come to it really gently. So 
So for me, I was like, that's careful looking. That's being a, making a visitor totally aware. Um, so that's worth it, right? Um, but it also means that they have to give us access to the space earlier and so on. And if they rush, if we rush that, then there's risk that we're kind of rushing the system, right? And it could fail. I've also done a lot of tests in my studio. I kept one chance city up for six months and very little happened to it. I mean, I was actively working and moving things around. So, you know, I could tell them, well, it didn't break in my studio, you know, so I can give you some assurance, you know. But then they would say, but we have crowds of 200 people coming in, school groups and so on, you know. Uh, they would be concerned about the air vents and so on. But, it, you know, it was kind of like, just like believing and trusting an artist. Like, I think that they have to learn to do that and not tell the artist what can and cannot be done. And I think, well, why not? You know, um, If it fails, I'll be there to re rebuild it, even though I kind of like the chance that it could fall. And if the whole thing falls, then you'll have to explain it to someone that they ruined the whole piece. <laughs> I mean, I just think it's challenging. you know. And, and so for me, it's really interesting to work with institutions who want to take that adventure with me. And then oftentimes, institutions don't, and I don't want to work with them either. You know? Um, I'm curious about your process. Um, when you get this challenge, do you try different um, materials and different ways of installing it? Prior to yeah. yeah, I mean it's sort of all of the above. I mean part of it is I do start with the site and I try to get information about the site and what kind of ideas I want to have a conversation around. You know, um, so there might be a series of conversations, right? And then I have to figure out like of those conversations, what's the material that's there on the site that I can procure or that's available or has a kind of an interesting synergy, you know, uh, at the moment. And sometimes I have a backlog of materials I've always been wanting to work with. So I'm always like, could that try it on? And of course, you always try on that dress, right? And I'm like, ah, not, no, no, it's not, it goes back in the closet. You know, so you always do that a few times, you know, like you always want that project to be it. Uh, I had the key project for a long time. I went to Arizona uh, and I was like, mountains, keys, got it. And they're like, what? <laughs> And I was like, no, I have something. I'm not, it's too early to tell you because I don't know how to explain that to you. But there's something about some intimate topography that's there, you know, that I had to find the research and dot the I's when I got home. Yes, bronze, you know, the, um, the bronze state, right? The, the cop I'm sorry, the copper state. So it's the mining of copper, right? And then doing the research, like, well, so what is the key made out of brass has a component of copper, you know? So doing that research and sort of in my mind, dotting the I's, you know? So uh, sometimes that happens. Sometimes I do the research and something in the research triggers and then I have to go find the materials. Yeah, it's a lot of conversation. Um, I've said in, in the past, like reflection about my process, I learned so much from being um, a kind of a novice journalist when I was at, uh, in college. So I ran the newspaper. Um, I took an interest, like I was, did the yearbook when I was in high school, you know, so obviously took an interest in publications and writing, um, but it wasn't something I think I'm a good writer. I, I struggle with writing all the time, right? But then um, as that opportunity came about, I just did, did it because I took an interest in it. And part of the interest was being an activist, being like a student leader and having conversations with people. I was just very curious. So I did that for a very long time throughout my entire education. I probably spent more time there than my studio. Um, and so I now realize when people ask me, like, how do you, do, you know, how do you work? What's your process? I actually feel like, well, it's kind of like, a journalist, you know, like you get assigned or someone assigns you or you say, I'm interested in that place and you show up, right? And they say, who should I talk to? You know, and then you start asking questions and then suddenly some, you find a story there, right? And then you find like someone, there's certain narratives that are always told to you and then there's certain narratives no one wants to talk about, you know, so I'm kind of interested in like, what's the real story here? You know, but one that wouldn't embarrass the people who I interviewed, you know, but also be 
a reflective like critique as well. You know, so a balance of that. So I find that a lot of what I learned, you know, just kind of informal journalism is often the same process I use um, being an artist. Um, and then another component that informed my process was um, my husband's an architect. And when we were starting out and we shared a studio, um, it was so interesting how long his projects took and how like we as artists just get so frustrated. Oh my God, I've worked on this forever. Nothing's happening, it's been a week. You know? <laughs> and he's worked on the same project for two years. And I was oh my God. You know, we need to be really, really patient. And like, he'll do the research and he'll double check like every nail, you know, to make sure that there's enough. You know, meaning if, for, from the engineers, if you don't know, you find a consultant. If you don't know, you ask someone else. If you don't know, you find another way. You know, you, you just keep problem solving forever, right? But there is something like who's the user of the project? Who, what's the impact? So a lot of um, kind of what I learned in architecture from him, watching him go through the process, made me self-reflect about our biases as, as artists. Um, so, and so I wasn't also afraid to take on large scale projects that were labor intensive, involved other people, um, and took a lot of time. Take it away. <laughs> so, uh, um, one of the sort of common things I've seen in the projects that you've showed us today is uh, a significant amount of labor, right? Uh, and you mentioned that. And so I'm, I'm sort of curious how how do you, as an artist, sort of engage that as part of the work, or and or um, how is that sort of you know managed, controlled? I mean, there's so many components to to this, and I'm not really even for, you know asking the whole question, but it seems like such a um, an important part of what you do. I'm wondering how you um, sort of frame that in your mind and mm -hmm. how you come up with the work and is that something you think about or is it just like, well, whatever it takes, you know, I mean. Mm. So in the beginning on the practical level, it was my own labor, um, but then over time, um, you know, my studio has been filled with amazing interns and my students and then various communities um, and so it's grown. And I've learned to, um, in some way, be as generous bringing people in as it is to kind of work together, right? So um, now I'm very open to anyone who wants to come work with me kind of thing. Um, and that's, a, that's not me being greedy. That's actually a real disruption, you know? It's a give and take relationship when you inherit labor, right? Um, it's also, even if you pay for it, then you, you gotta budget, right? And you gotta raise the funds. So either way, I think labor and economy and, and you know, labor is political, you know? So for me, um, I'm very aware of like which labors are undervalued and being that I'm, I'm a female artist, um, labor often from the gender role can have that c component too. Um, what's our labor worth versus, you know, a male um, figure. Um, and then also being um, from an immigrant and people of color, you know, this kind of invisible class, invisible population. Um, so there's a lot of spaces I understand it comes from. Um, labor that is also off seas and, you know, kind of, um, co-opted, you know? Um, so that's why I show you the process and be as transparent as I can when I'm talking to you, you know? That there are assistants, there are interns, there are lots of collaborators and participants, there are fabricators, there are people who um, give me materials for free, um, who are part of the project to me. So um, each project is different, um, so I, I try to navigate that. Um, but managing labor is, is um, a lot of what I do, um, but also in doing that work, I want it to be um, a, a kind of informed engagement, right? So oftentimes I use local labor. Um, that's been my recent practice. So if a project like in Louisville, um, I don't do the project in New York and bring it over. I sort of say, okay, I've got, I'm doing, I maybe do as minimal site visits as I can, and then activate and introduce my presence to a bunch of people locally 
who were all on game to work with me. And then it's a by Skype, by Facebook, you know, like um, FaceTime, all of this to be like, okay, now you're on site. No, I saw this. Could you go and talk to this person or could you follow up on this person? So I have like a project team that grows and develops. And for me, that's a lasting impact that my work can have on individuals in the community long after the, the project is done. Right? And so they were all there, but the, it, so the, the artwork is a catalyst for them to meet each other and be involved in a project together for a temporary level. So that happened at universities, um, public art projects, you know, museums, um, even at MoMA, it's like all these people work there, but they've never really done anything together that was meaningful, right? So the art project became kind of the, the glue. So I often say that, that my project builds community, um, by inviting and asking for their labor and you know um, and so um, yeah it's an exchange yeah very much for me does that answer your question sufficiently or is there a critique in there that you want to come back with me on um, <laughs> no, no there's no critique the only thing I was thinking of as you were No, no critique, but critique. But the the only th I was thinking about a follow up as you were mm -hmm. answering your question, which is, um, so what? How do you um, how do you manage or or sort of co um, coordinate or, or sort of uh, hmm, now what's the word? I'm trying to think. Anyway, so what's the relationship between paid and unpaid? I mean. Mm -hmm. we, we all know that, you know, artists are If I have funding, you're paid. <laughs> That's it. And if I have funding before I have funding, you get paid. You know, so, I, I, you know, my measly salaries, teaching, whatever, those, those pay me. But usually my assistants, if I hire them, get paid before I do. Um, and then if I have no budget for a project, then I get interns. And with the internship, it's a mutual thing. I, I tell them up front, like, until like that budget comes through, and it might, and it might not, you know. But I'm taking the same risk, right? But for me, I'm an educator first, and I'm someone who takes care of my interns so that they have a learning experience. So you're not paying me to work under me or with me or learn from me, right? So unlike your relationship with your institution, where you have to pay tuition, you know, these students are not paying me to learn from me, right? So it's a mutually beneficial thing. So I make sure that they're learning make sure that they're doing things that challenge them and, and grow, grow over the project. And I give them the fun stuff too, not the <laughs> judge stuff. You know, I invite them, I introduce them. You know, they're part of my right hand, left hand, kind of left brain, right brain kind of moment. So it, it's a hopefully a mutually satisfying condition until it's not, you know? And at some point when they learn enough, I can hire them on a project need basis when I have funding, or they move on and they get fabulous jobs for other people and I've trained them. <laughs> you know, so I kind of feel like it's an uh, informal internship. Um, I hope that we can all get paid sufficiently, but it's a chain that goes up and down, <laughs> you know. So I don't think I'm um, keeping anyone down. If you don't need a free job, I don't need my free jobs, but I do plenty of free jobs, you know, because I enjoy doing them and I get something out of it. That's not a monetary um, equivalent to that experience of value. So that's why I sort of stick by. There's things that we do plenty for free and for the generosity. Um, and if you feel that you can be generous and you're in a position to be, then you do. And if you can, total respect to move, move on, right? So I think that's the terms. And so I offer something um, if someone's giving free labor. <coughs> that's how I internalize it, because it's a system that doesn't work. Like, I wish artists were all being paid. Yes, I, uh, yeah, okay. uh, I have friends who has a like, site-specific work in the bloody corner. And uh, I'm there when he uh, negotiate with the founder. And uh, so my question is, sometimes the funding is not, not that generous. When you have your design and they are 
counting about everything. They want to save money, and how do you see how do you see that? How do you deal with that kinds of question? If you want to like the affection or do the thing like this, but they are cutting the money off. So that's the first thing. And the, then comes to the question about the site specific. When when you are going to build up the whole installation works. Uh, it seems more like uh, architecture work. It's not like something like our process. So how do you see your identity doing the site-specific work? Like when, when you are, because doing our process, sometimes we, when we are doing that, our, our, we got new inspiration, our idea change, but it has so much thing to do about the founders, about the labors, but what if you, do, you have a better ideas during the process? What will you do? Yeah. Well, so if you're working with a museum, um, you might be able to talk with a curator about your new fabulous idea. And if it's a good curator, they'll respond, you know? But they might also have sent out a press release <laughs> about the project, so they had to renege it, right? And be like, but it's all gonna be great, right? So I've worked with amazing curators who are on that adventure with me. And we lost funding. They're like, this is the bad news. Do you want the bad news or the good news? And I'm like, OK, give me the bad news. No funding. OK, we lost that funding. What does that mean? Does that mean we had to cancel the show? Does it mean, you know, so then we, I, I go, well, you know, like that um, Arizona project, you know, do I let create less pieces? <laughs> do I get rid of something? Do I, you know, so we have to really be creative, right? And so I was actually, we introduced a whole nother melting of keys to make the base. So we did this whole other thing that we engaged another fabricator saying, how much does that material cost? Don't have it, but we can give you the material. You just have to transform it. <laughs> like, <laughs> and they went for it and it was amazing, right? So I think that the funding will get lost all the time. So, but then I think that's the challenge to be like, that's more interesting. I thought it was more interesting that I didn't use up raw materials for that project. It was actually recycled back into the project. So I preferred that as opposed to someone paying for that material, right? I didn't know it because I had the luxury of the funding when I thought of the idea and had plenty of other problems that I was solving. But then when the funding ran out, it made sense to reconsider like, is there any fat in this? And is there someone else who's willing to take that risk with me? And some people are. You know, that person's still cursing me today. <laughs> but he did it, and he did a fabulous job, but he was not happy doing it at the end. Um, but we did it, you know? So, um, so sometimes you do change your mind. Sometimes life changes it for you, right? And then you still say, well, do you still want to do the project? And my answer always is typically, like, I still want to do the project, right? But it might be a slightly different project, right? It might have to stretch the idea, you know? Um, maybe you can't use 20 reds. You have to decide on three important reds, <laughs> you know? Um, so y you have to, you know, even in the long-term projects, that MTA project at Second Avenue took seven years. I was like, every year, it's like, oh my god, I have to revisit which red did I choose? You know, I'm like, oh, I like this more. I was like, nope, you already chose that other red. <laughs> you know, so that does happen when you revisit a project, you know. Um, but then you also trust, like you trust your fabricators. You, it goes both ways. So it's like, I gotcha. We talked about it, it's moving, you'll love it. And you can't backtrack on that either. So it's a real mutual respect, you know, about working together, you know, and there's confidence. And if people really feel like there's a crisis or a problem, then hopefully you have people who to call to be like, we gotta stop everything. We gotta stop the show. There's something really important, you know? Um, so changing your mind is possible, um, though sometimes for me, like if you're working on a seven year project, you move on. Like you finish that project, but you're off doing 20 other things. So you don't care if that one's, if you have a new idea, go do your new idea <laughs> elsewhere. So for me, if I'm working on a long project that's very tight or tight budget, you know, then I'd like to do a project that actually isn't that. You know, um, and vice versa. If someone asked me, I did a big public art project, and then someone asked me a project that has like five thousand dollars on a budget, I'm like, that's not a budget, but I'll say yes <laughs> because why not be generous? And then it's like, okay, but this is how we have to do it, you know. And like, who can we convince to do this work with me, you know? But I'll do it, 
you know, because it's not the money that's important. For me, it's the commitment, right? And they're offering their space, they're offering a lot of other things than the budget, and they're not great fundraisers, right? So then we're not all good fundraisers, right? But I don't then make it a hurdle, like unless that comes with 50,000 plus, I'm not calling you back. I, I, I don't operate that way. If it's an interesting project, sometimes I have a new idea, and I'll be like, I'll do that idea, and there's no risk for me there, because we're just gonna see how it goes. And if nothing happens, then it's a small project, you know, you know. But then I learn something in that prototyping, right? So someone's giving me a little money to develop and research and just do something. And then if it doesn't, and no one's going to be just too disappointed. But I would have actually engaged in another path, and then gone to another museum, and maybe there's some remnant of that idea that can be applied, right? So it's a very evolving, fluid process. Um, so when you ask me that question of the identity as an artist, um, I don't define myself as trying to be stuck anywhere. Like, I, I was a painter. I was doing landscapes and self-portraits, you know? And I thought that's the, my world. I was so into it, <laughs> you know? And what's so nice is that I never stopped thinking about, like, well, what can I learn from that project? You know, and what is the next project? You know, so I don't get stuck in one. I sort of learn from it to say, okay, I want to do something different here, right? Um, so I feel more confident, even though I don't know what I'm doing, because every single time it's a new project, right? So you become better at being a novice, right? And then having been a novice for a long time. 